Let's talk Brooklyn Nets, a team that I don't really think knows what they're doing. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast, brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd, and I'm really trying to debate what the best thing is from a country bakery. Is it a vanilla slice or is it a sausage roll? I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter as always, at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. We're going to talk more about Monopoly Go. It's the fast-paced game that lets you team up with friends for tournaments to unlock awesome prizes, like unique stickers for trading, cool playing pieces, and hilarious emojis for taunting your friends. So download Monopoly Go now for free on Google Play or the App Store. What was I going to say then? Thank you also. Yeah, thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. So double bang it, so thumb it up, so leave your comments and subscribe. Like I said yesterday, I think I said it yesterday, I was on the Locked On Fantasy Baseball podcast the other day. So go check me out over there, Talking Baseball. If you want to hear someone who doesn't know what they're talking about, talk about it. That's me. The other guys do. Go and check me out over there. All right, we're talking um, Brooklyn Nets. That's where we're at in terms of the worst teams. They were one of the worst one of the worst 10 teams in the NBA. And uh, yeah, they sucked. Pretty straightforward stuff. They were just terrible. So let's dig into what was terrible about them. Do they know that they're terrible? How are they going to fix being terrible? What does that mean for us fantasy-wise? I'm not, I'm not really sure. There are a lot of questions here. They finished 32 and 50. They had a negative 2.9 net rating. So you see there is a significant difference between what they were doing and what the Jazz were doing and the Hornets and all those teams. But also remember that this team does not have a draft pick. So they didn't have the incentive to be significantly worse. They were actually trying. And that's that's probably as damning a thing as you can say is they were trying. And this is where we got. 23rd best offense, 20th on defense. Their preseason over-under was 37 and a half wins. So Vegas and the over-under lines thought, yeah, this team's not very good. The Nets don't think really disagreed on that. I had them at, initially had them at 36, and then I scaled that down to 32 as my over-under. So I I banged it on. Wow, look at that. I got 32 wins for them. And so we hit the under on that one. So that's a W there too. Love that. Love that there. Uh, Don't love it if you're a Nets fan. But like I said, I just, what are they doing? Because they don't have a pick. They traded these picks to Houston for James Harden. And if you're reporting, the reporting is to be believed. The Rockets said, do you want it back? Do you want your picks back? Just give us Mikhail Bridges. And this team said no, which is insane. Why would you do that? You're, you're surely watching Mikhail Bridges play, yeah? Fine player. Good player. Not worth more than multiple unprotected first round picks that are your own that would lead you to actually tank, get a top 10 pick this year, maybe something better. Just ridiculous GMing. I don't understand anything about what this team has done of recent times. So we will see. They hired a new coach, Jordy Fernandez from the Kings assistant coach. We'll see what he is able to bring. He's got very good reputation uh, for Sacramento, Team Canada as well. But like I said, they don't have a draft pick. So their first round pick is unprotected. It goes to Houston, but they don't have a second either. Their second goes to Memphis. I don't even know what trade that was part of. But they don't, so they, they should have had 9 and 39 with a lottery shot to move higher. They got none of them. So they can't rebuild through the draft unless they make other trades or buy picks. That's why not trading for Mikhail Bridge or trading Mikhail Bridges away is literally like just stupid. I don't understand any of it. Maybe the reporting's false. Maybe that offer wasn't there. But we also heard that last season there was like maybe four first round picks on the table for Mikhail Bridges at the deadline. And they still didn't do it. Yeah, to flip him after the Suns deal. Man, if you're a Nets fan, you should feel like frustrated. Very much so. Most of their best lineups included players that don't remain on the team, and the most common starting group included Spencer Dinwiddie. 
and he was not on the team either. They traded him away to the Raptors, and the Raptors went, absolutely not. We are cutting you immediately. He went to the Lakers and just didn't do anything because he's bad. But they relied upon him pretty significantly. The most common starting lineup of the players who remain on this team or remained on this team towards the end of the season, Dennis Schroeder, Cameron Thomas, Mikael Bridges, Dorian Finney-Smith, and Nick Claxton. One of those guys might not be here because he's a free agent, and that's Claxton. But there might be a million other things that happened. Does Schroeder move on? Do they actually trade Bridges? What about Finney Smith? I, 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 they are in one of the worst spots, I would suggest, in the NBA currently. Like, just a terrible position to be in. Their best lineup was actually the same group of guys, but it was only a plus 3.8. Again, their best lineups, which if I was to include their absolute best grouping, included Spencer Dinwiddie. And because he's not on the team, I'm not going to include that in the best lineups. The best lineup did include, it was a plus 44.8, which is unbelievably good. It was Dinwiddie, Bridges, Johnson, Finney Smith, and Daron Sharp. Their second best lineup was Simmons, Dinwiddie, Thomas, Bridges, and Finney Smith. So like a centerless lineup with Simmons at center, or Finney Smith, however you want to phrase that. But those guys aren't on the team. Well, Dinwiddie's not on the team. In terms of restricted free agents this upcoming offseason, not much that really matters there. There's Trenton Watford, who's an okay depth piece, and then Keon Johnson and Jacob Gilliard, who signed after basically his two-way days were done in Memphis. Memphis cut him, and he came across here. Keon, an athletic player who's really done nothing in the NBA, and Watford, again, an interesting player. I don't think you're prioritizing him in a significant way. The big question is going to be what happens with the unrestricted group. There's three of them. One of them is Nick Claxton, who reports would say $25 million a year at the moment. I'm not sure the Nets should be investing in that, to be honest. We'll see what they do. I'm not sure other teams should be, but Claxton had a down year. Lonnie Walker, the fourth, and Dennis Smith Jr., two minimum signing backup guards they got. Walker, I don't really ever think much is changing with him. He has these little flashes, but he's the same player all the time. He's a guy that can score if you give him the ball a lot, and even then the efficiency waxes and wanes, and there's nothing else that he does. And that's just not a, and especially not when you've got Cam Thomas there, that's not a play you really need to have any prioritization for. Dennis Smith, one of the best defensive guards in the NBA, but his offense is so bad, or his shooting, sorry, not his offense, his shooting, he's so bad that it does limit what he can do. But teams would be very smart to offer a little bit more than the minimum to Dennis Smith because having that player who can capably fill in as a point guard if you have run into a situation, but can also go out there and provide unbelievable level defense is, is something that is useful. DeLon Wright, Chris Dunn, these sort of players. TJ McConnell, but a different sort of player than TJ McConnell. So they're their three unrestricted free agents. There's one bloke who does have a player option. That's Keita Bates Diop. He came across in that Suns deal this season that saw three-way with Memphis and David Roddy heading across to um, Phoenix. Bates Diop has a player option because the Suns enticed all the minimum contract players to come across with a player option because that meant that they had to pay more tax and it gave the players more of an advantage. I would expect that Bates Diop, considering he didn't do anything in Brooklyn or in Phoenix, to be honest, will just pick that up because there's no guarantee he even gets a contract. And there's one non-guaranteed contract, and that will be picked up, I'm certain. That's Jalen Wilson, who started the season on a two-way. I thought he played really well. Forced the Nets' hand to convert him to a full-time, longer contract. Again, non-guarantee. And then they just didn't play him as much down the stretch. It was, again, really weird. But he showed enough to be considered, I think, at least a a rotation player in the future. Their next offseason is where it becomes very intriguing because look at all of these names that are expiring. The number one name on that list is Ben Simmons. And I say the number one name, not because he's the best player, but because that contract is gigantic and it frees up everything. Does he become now somewhat of an asset in terms of expiring salary? Uh, that's possible. Dennis Schroeder, also an unrestricted free agent after this season. This will be his contract year. Cameron Thomas, will be um, heading into restricted free agency, so he's going to be an uh, extension-eligible player. So is Dayron Sharp. They're extension-eligible this offseason. You've got Dorian Finney-Smith, who has a player option, so he could become an unrestricted free agent after this season or after the 24-25 season. And then Jalen Martin on the two-way will become restricted. But that's a lot there. Schroeder, Simmons, Thomas, and Sharp, who, again, both rookies, both rookie extension-eligible as first-round picks. I would imagine Sharp doesn't get an extension, but Thomas probably does. Otherwise, they're heading into restricted free agency. And that's where we sit with um, with their, their off-season plans again, but they're hamstrung. Their salaries are all messed up because of Simmons, because of what we don't know what's going to happen with Claxton. They've got no draft picks to, to replenish 
and they're bad with a young head coach. So that they still have these delusions of attracting all these free agents that these free agents don't really exist at the moment. So I don't know. It's, it is just a really, really rough spot for for Brooklyn to be in and for, for Brooklyn's fans because we just, I don't have any confidence in it. Today's episode is brought to you by Yahoo Finance. I've got confidence in that. You can see all of your investment stuff, all of your retirement accounts in one place. What a great idea that is because that is exactly what, it's not an idea because it's a reality. Yahoo Finance does it. All of your accounts, multiple accounts consolidated onto one hub and you can get the expert analysis that you need to tend to your entire portfolio. Got your 401ks in there, all your other investments. Yahoo Finance makes it easy to manage them. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. They're the number one finance destination, providing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, breaking news, original editorial content, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That is yahoofinance.com. Okay, so that is going to bring us to talk about the starters on this team. And given the way the roster currently sits, I think we've probably got eight candidates, seven candidates, who could potentially be starters, or they could move things around. There are a lot of just different names on this team. So we'll go through those guys first. Number one is the guy that wasn't drafted as the highest ranked player on this team, but ended up in that spot. That's Nick Claxton. Claxton was, I think, better the previous season, but we saw with Claxton also is that he was really, really good when Kevin Durant was there, and then when Durant left, it did fall off a little bit. His ADP was 54. I saw him going higher than that in a lot of spots. Well, that's what ADP does. But he ended up 68th in minus one. That's you know, taking away the bad free throws. 64th in points. He averaged 12 and 10. Didn't hit any threes, of course. 2.1 blocks. Again, the volatility of blocks. 63 from the field, 55 from the line is putrid. He did take some threes. He didn't hit any. 20, well, he barely hit any. 20% on threes. What I find interesting is his best comp for last season was year six of Jarrett Allen, the guy that he ostensibly replaced as the starting center well, after DeAndre Jordan left. And the other one was not as, not as uh, rosy of a comparison. That's Tony Bradley in year four. Claxton has at times flashed different things offensively. He is fast. Sometimes he can dribble and bring the ball up. Sometimes you go, oh, is there somewhat of a shot there? No, I think the answer is no. Is there any passing? Well, there's absolutely none of that. But as a guy that can actually dribble and drive, that's not a common thing you see in centers. But I think it's not like a, a tough thing to say to suggest that he got worse this season. He's only 25. He played 71 games. He played 30 minutes. You'd love that to be 33 a night. There were some shenaniganizings going on with whatever coach was in charge, Vaughn or Ollie. Now it's Fernandez. I don't know where Claxton ends up. Is Claxton a good pairing with like Jaron Jackson? I think he is. It's a lot of rim protection. But I think that's a not a bad pairing. But he obviously can't shoot. So you've got to look at who else is around. But he can do more things on offense, I think, than he's been asked to do. But in terms of, again, where fantasy rankings put someone, someone like this, we have to really look and go, what is he? Rebounds, blocks, field goal percentage. It's really, that's what he is. And I'm not really sure we're ever going to get any of that other stuff bumping any higher. His impact stuff was down. 65th percentile EPM, 74th on CPM. And what's really troubling is his defensive rebound quality, how good of a defensive rebound you are, 31st percentile. Now, you average 10 rebounds a game, so that's ridiculous. But these take into consideration a lot of other factors mean that like he's not a super strong rebounder. There's a lot of other factors that are a part of that. And that is something that needs to be worked on. He doesn't have the huge strength. He can get pushed around a little bit. I think this area, this 60, or let's say 50 to 75 range in fantasy, if he's a starter, he's probably realistic. But as we know so often, blocks are variable. They go back and forth year on year. But as also you get older, usually, Brook Lopez notwithstanding, as a usual thing, as players age, and he's what, 25, blocks will drop. Look at Miles Turner, one of the best examples of that. Jaron Jackson's also happened last season, but there's other factors there. I'm not saying it always happens. But if you were to plot the trend line of blocks across a career, it's nearly always going to be heading down. 
And when you are a player like Claxton, whose fantasy value relies upon three categories and there's a chance of one of them dropping, that's where we run into some problems with evaluating where he is. The next guy is the player who was taken first out of all the Nets players in fantasy drafts and one of the biggest disappointments of the entire season, and that's Mikhail Bridges. Bridges is about to turn 28. Of course, he played every game. He's played every game for his whole career, but we know what this means? Nothing. It doesn't mean anything moving forward. It does not prevent him getting injured. What I would suggest, maybe, maybe this is true, I would say that him playing in 82 games, every game of his career, made his season much worse this season. For two reasons. You are fatigued. You could see that everything for him just got worse and worse and worse as the season went on. And I am convinced he was injured. He had like a wrist arm thing. He left a couple of games with the locker room, came back. But he pushes through those games. It made his performance and the team's performance worse when he could have taken a week off, missed three games, rested it up, got it treated, come back, all good to go. But there's this thing that, like, this is what he hangs his hat on. I don't miss games. Cool. You cost your team games, but you don't miss them. Like, what, what benefit does Mikhail Bridges, what benefit does 82 games of Mikhail Bridges bring this team that was 32 and 50? What, what does it do? I'm not... I don't know that if he took a week off because of the wrist hand issue that he would have come back and been better and they would have won 10 more games and made the playoffs. I don't know that that's true. But this fetishization about playing... And he's going to get an injury. Like, it's going to happen. I guarantee you. I don't know when. I don't want it to. I don't want anyone to get hurt. But it will. You can't avoid it at all at all costs. And it's one of those things, again, in fantasy, that people look at and go, well, he never gets hurt. I'll just draft him. Look at where he is in totals. Yahoo's still ranked him 55th this season. Like, that's not remotely close to how good he was. He's 91st in minus one. He was 76th in points. His ADP was 20. I still had him about, I think, 30 or 31 in the preseason. So I, I didn't think he'd be this bad, but I was definitely like, you take him in. Some people took him in round one, which was insane. Some people took him in round two. And I was like, I'm not interested in this at all. Because again, all, all that needs to happen is that, like, if your thing that bumps you that high is you play all the games, well, if you get worse as a player, well, who cares? And then if you actually miss some time, then the value, just if it's gone. It evaporates. You are working on a best case scenario of this guy just never missing any time. That's your, you, know, you are drafting based on the best case. And that means there's only one way that it goes, and that's down. He didn't end up averaging 20 points a game, which I thought was a little surprising. 19.6 with 2.7 triples, 4.5 rebounds, 3.6 assists with a steal. His defensive stats have plummeted since coming from Phoenix. His efficiency has plummeted. He was like, I think, a 63% two-point guy in Phoenix. He's down to 49 with 37 on threes. That's 44 overall. He just brutalized so much. Part of the reason that he had appeal in fantasy, low turnovers, high steals, good out-of-position blocks, great field goal percentage. And three of the or, and great free throws. Three of those things disappeared. Yeah, he bumped his usage, but like again, what good was that? The best comp for him was the second season of Bogdan Bogdanovich. Of course, that's not like 20-year-old Bogdan. He came across at 26-27. And the other one was a year six of Christian James McCullum. And I think that's about right. A lot of people were looking at Bridges like this new superstar. The Nets have got their guy. When in the end, he's a role player. And that's exactly what Bogdan and CJ are. And they need to be, like, and I am, we'll talk about him later. I am not a Cam Thomas guy, but he's got more superstar upside equity than Bridges does. I think that's, I think that's clear. It wasn't a disaster from a season, if, depending on where your expectations were for Bridges. 81st percentile, EPM, 69th on CPM. That's totally reasonable for a second or third best player. to be a really good, good option, good solid starter. Obviously, it just got worse and worse and worse as, maybe it's not obvious, but it did. As the season went on, he was worse and worse and worse. He couldn't hit any shots. He was overtaxed in the wrong role. And maybe put him back to that fourth offensive guy, strong defensive player. I, I, there's nothing to me that suggests that Bridges demands to be Jeremy Granting, being the number one player on a bad team. There's nothing to suggest that he wouldn't be like, if I'm on a good team, I'll play my role. Uh, maybe I'm wrong on that, but I haven't seen anything like that. One of the things that is really telling about Bridges' season is why he's maybe not suited to be that number one guy is 59th percentile free throw rate. With the, to me, there were a lot of red flags in what he did in Brooklyn the year before. He basically wasn't getting to the rim. He was settling for like pull-up mid-ranges and they were going in at an insane number. Well, that's not going to hold. There's no way. You've got to either get to the rim and get fouls 
or you got to take the threes. You can't live on this uncontested, no, not uncontested, this plop mid-range game and expect them to go in at that level. You got to hit the rim, you got to hit threes, and you got to draw free throws. He didn't draw free throws, didn't work out. I would not touch Bridges in this current form in the top 50 next season. Again, I didn't have him first two rounds this season, but I had him third. Wouldn't touch him in the first four. We are getting to peak Bridges zone. And one of my old phrases that I've said a lot is that the more seasons you go without getting hurt, well, that means the closer you are to getting hurt. He's, it's going to happen. I hope it doesn't. I hope it's nothing major. I hope it's an ankle sprain. He misses a game or two or something, but it's going to happen. You, you are, he is not, I think we're well aware of this, he is not Wolverine. He's not impervious. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Are you going to Monopoly Go to the polls or are you going to Monopoly Go to the App Store and download the free game? Because you should, and it's fun. With Monopoly Go, you can team up with your friends for timed tournaments, help build each other's boards up, The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you can unlock. You can trade stickers to complete sets to get rewards in-game. But you can also have a little bit of a sneaky bit on the side where you go smash down some of their landmarks. You go into their bank vault and conduct a heist. Take some of that cash out of there. Cool playing pieces can be unlocked. Not just your standard car, dog, thimble, hat. I think I'm rolling with a sombrero on uh, Monopoly Go at the moment. But so many different ways that you can play the game. There's always something fun and changing on Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and download it now for free in the Google Play Store or on the App Store. Monopoly Go, bang, game on. Okay. Now it's time to talk about Cam Thomas. I have said many, many times my thoughts on Thomas. I don't like watching him play. I, I don't like this style of play. Everyone, kick back. Cam's got it. And yeah, look, he is a really high-level scorer. My problem with him is it's a lot of dribble, 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 pull up, hezzy, mid-range, long two, instead of getting all your teammates involved or doing anything defensively. And that's great when you can run with this big usage and you can score a lot of points. And people love it. Man, look at this. 30 a night. What a gun. Superstar. Build around him. The problem is, is that like we can talk about, oh, maybe maybe players don't want to fit next to Luka Doncic because of his ball dominant style. Well, imagine trying to play with that where a guy that doesn't pass or isn't transcended as a scorer or a player or anything like that and gives worse effort defensively. I just hate the style that Cam Thomas has. Hate it. Inefficient shots where he takes too many of them. But he took massive strides this season. I still don't think that you want to say, and I said he's got more superstar upside than Bridges, and that is, I think that's very clear. That doesn't mean that he's a good bet to be a superstar. That doesn't mean that I want to build around him as a number one, because I, I wouldn't. I think that's a bad idea. But if I had to choose between him and Bridges to do it, well, I, I would choose Thomas. And I would hope that some of his worst tendencies can be corralled. And they sort of were a little bit. Despite the success that we think Cam Thomas had this season, and he did have success. He wasn't drafted anywhere, really. He only finished 112th in category leagues. He finished 86th in points leagues. And there was a stretch during the middle of the season when I was like, oh, I'm, I'm not interested in holding on to him. I said, I'd, I'd be okay dropping him. Always with the caveat that I don't really buy into him as a player. But he was like, for two and a half months, the 260th ranked player. All right? Which is clearly not a player you hold on to. But before that, solid, solid run. After that, really good. Huge improvements. And he will be drafted in every league next season. Where he is drafted is going to be interesting. He averaged 22 points with two threes, three rebounds, and three assists on 0.7 steals. I don't think you're ever getting steals from him. He played 31 minutes. He's aged only 22. He's still really young. The shooting is where we get to the sum of the problems and the lack of supporting stats. You got the points are great. For the threes, he's about average. Rebounds below average, assists below average, steals below average, blocks below average, field goal percentage below average. Free throws above average, that's good. But he still doesn't get a huge amount of those. His best comps were Brandon Knight, year three, and Tim Hardaway Jr., year two. I wouldn't say I'm particularly encouraged by either of those. He was 56th percentile EPM, despite scoring 22 a night. 26th in crafted plus minus, that's bad. And part of the thing, again, that's part of the play style is that he's 34th percentile in three-point attempt rate. He doesn't take them. He hit 36% threes, 
but he settles on, he doesn't get to the rim a huge amount. He's a pretty good, he's not, not great. But 36 percentile, 36% from three and only 34th percentile on attempts. It's the play style stuff. And I think that limits a lot of what the team could do if he is just fully empowered to be the player that he is. Again, there were significant changes from Thomas this season. And that I'm not going to preclude that you know, he improves even further. But of the Nets regulars this season, the worst on-off rating for anyone on this team was Cam Thomas, minus 6.7. Next, it was Claxton at negative 5.7. The team was significantly better when he was on the bench versus when he was starting, more so than any player on this team. And when you're scoring 22 a night, that gives me massive red flag vibes. It means what the hell else was happening when you were out there? And the answer is really not much. And that's where, again, we, there can be plenty of improvement. He's 22. There can be a lot of improvement coming still. But eventually, that, if that keeps being the case, it doesn't matter how many points you score. Eventually, a team will be like, you just can't play that role. And then the fantasy value, because he does nothing else, disappears. I would think that next season has the potential for him to crack into the top 100 for the first time. I think that's probably likely. But I also have some real concerns about his longevity. Let's talk Dennis Schroeder, who came across in the trade from the Raptors. The Raptors got him in, free agent, started him, and then he went crazy and then really started to struggle and came across to Brooklyn. Had some struggles there as well. But in the end, they started playing him a lot of minutes, and that is where the thing goes with him, isn't it? Schroeder is 30. He played 80 games and 31 minutes. But what happens? Like, what does this team do? Is Ben Simmons going to start? If he is ever healthy, probably not, yeah? Is Schroeder and Thomas the starting group? Does Schroeder and Simmons even work at all together? Given that this will be the final contract, this will be an expiring year for Schroeder, what, do you prioritize him at all? They don't have another point guard. They don't have a young point guard at all. So I, don't, I, I think his upside is really, really low. 14, 3, and 6 with 0.8 steals, 1.7 threes. 44 and 84. He shot 38 from 3. He shot 47 from 2. Like, they're fine. The best comps for him were Corey Joseph in year 12. Yuck. And Joe Johnson in year 11. That's much better. He was 57th percentile EPM, 21st in CPM. What was encouraging is his passing rating was 93rd percentile. So he did pass well. But he's just like the definition of below mid, I would say, for an NBA point guard. You always want to upgrade that position. But when he's out there, he does enough to make you go, oh, I guess that's okay. And that's where the question lies here. Do they go back to Simmons as the point guard? Simmons, Thomas, Bridges, Johnson, center, which might be Claxon, might not be. Does Simmons play at center if claxon has gone? And Schroeder starts. Look, Schroeder shot well, but I don't really view him as this high volume, good value shooter. I just think there's so little value in him from a fantasy point of view. He is 30, and there's no way that this team is committing to him to be this long-term piece. But I think there's always a level of risk of a low upside guy that might fall off completely. I'm just not that interested in it. And we saw the fluctuations in his game a lot. And that brings us to the other guy that maybe is the point guard, maybe is the center, maybe never plays. I don't know, and that's Ben Simmons. I got this one really wrong. I won't say I got fooled, but mate, I probably did. He ended up playing just 15 games, 24 minutes a night. He's 28, Simmons. We saw he had the surgeries. He was playing. He was looking nowhere near his peak self, and we didn't consider him that player, which at a peak was a top 40 at worst fantasy player. But I was like, if I'm around pick 100, I'm okay with doing this on the right squad and understanding I'm not getting threes. I've got bad free throws. I'm getting rebounds. I'm getting steals. I'm getting big assists, and that it can be hard to come by. And in the end, like his overall fantasy rank, 111th per game. It's not bad. He just didn't play. 124th in points. He averaged six points. His usage was well down this season as well. He used to be like a 20 usage player. Just, just lost all confidence in it. Eight rebounds, 5.7 and 0.8 steals. 5.7 assists, sorry. 58 from the field, 40 from the line. That got worse. 5.7 assists to 1.8 turnovers is a great ratio there, though. What is very interesting to me is the comparisons to him in the game and his season, even though it's a small sample, were both centers. 
Yusuf Nurkic, year seven, and Vladi Divac, year seven. Is this what Simmons is now? Even though he thinks he's a point guard, his burst and explosion is not there. And I don't really think it's coming back. He was still, like, the advanced stuff is not bad. 66th percentile EPM, 78th in crafted. His offensive load was sitting at 73rd percentile. And for a guy that doesn't score, that's a big load, Giggity. It means he's doing a lot without taking any shots himself. But so much of this with Simmons is mental too. Obviously physical, the back is rooted. But he's not explosive. He doesn't attack. He doesn't have the athleticism he used to have. And he's just never going to take those shots, meaning teams need to scheme around him offensively. And I'm not sure that's worth it. That's part of the, Again, it's part of the problem with this team. Is two of your major guys, salary-wise Simmons, youth potential Thomas, require everything to be perfectly orchestrated around them. And I don't think that that means, that, I don't think they can work together doing that. So what do you do with that? You got Simmons' gigantic contract. Do you play him as a 15-minute backup? Does Thomas get limited? This is the problem here. I, I wouldn't be drafting Simmons next season. You watch to see how they use him, but there's just too many things like the, Conflict with Thomas, the lack of shooting, the presence of Schroeder, another back injury. It's just nothing that's great. Just a terrible year again, and I, I don't know that we ever get good ones. Speaking of a terrible year, Cam Johnson. I was way too high on Johnson. Way too high. He is a guy that's body. Part of the reason why it was a very big surprise to see him drafted where he was by the Suns was A, he was incredibly old, and also... Just on the Suns quickly, when we talk about them drafting, they don't care about the draft at all. James Jones said that we'll draft picks, who cares? Scouts, we don't even bother with it. We'll scout one or two guys and that's it. So when they picked him at 11, you know that they didn't do anywhere near enough research on any of those other guys. He had a lot of problems injury-wise with his hips in college. It was a big surprise at that age to go that high. And you fear that his body can't withstand this. He had, well, every time he played this year, something happened. And that is that is a problem. It's a little bit like Simmons, where you, the body is sort of crumbling. I thought that Johnson could be around the 70-80 mark for fantasy this year. I thought that they paid him that big contract. His spacing and shooting is really, really key, especially if Simmons is going to play and Claxton's out there. When you are that sort of a player who's limited defensively with a lot of injuries, you got to hit those shots at a big rate. And while 39% from three is fine, it's not 43. He was 160th in minus one with an ADP of 70. That is a massive miss, a huge miss. He averaged 13 and four with two and a half assists, 0.8 steals and 0.3 blocks, so nothing defensively. Only two and a half threes a game. He needs to be going three, 3.2 of them a game, at least 17 points. Shot 45 from the field. Weirdly forgot how to shoot free throws for a period. We ended up at 79. The best comp for him was year seven of Jamal Mashburn. That's, I believe, the season before Mashburn went to Charlotte. And year seven of Dennis Scott. He was 74th in EPM and 76th percentile and crafted. So it looks still positive impact-wise. His defensive versatility, I, I, we consider him not a great defender, but his versatility ranking 69th percentile was a little eye-opening to me. But like he's 28 already. It's year six for him now. He played 58 games with 28 minutes a night. The value he brings is in threes, and that's really it. And that, to me, is basically not going to be touchable in the top 100, and maybe not at all. Because, again, we've got still seven guys that I think have the potential to play, if not as a starter, starters minutes. Because only five of them can start at once with the way this team sits. Of course, Claxton may not return, but do you feel comfortable with full-time Simmons starting at center? Probably not. And you can't rely on that anyway. So a really, really disappointing season from Cam Johnson. And the last name, and he was in their best lineup, is Dorian Finney-Smith. He's not very good, and that's true. But he still is in the mix to start because what he brings is just not available in so many of many of their players. He's 31. He will be a free agent. He's got a player option after this season, so he could become a free agent. 68 games, 28 minutes, 183rd in minus one. He wasn't drafted rightfully, so eight points, five rebounds, 0.8. Steals, 0.6 blocks, 42 and 72. His shooting since he left Dallas has disappeared. Just can't shoot anymore. He was a 35 from three. That's cool, but all he does is take three, so you've got to be higher than that. Doesn't turn it over, but doesn't get assists. He doesn't generate anything offensively. He had some interesting moments when he played big minutes as a center. Upped his blocks up nicely, but you don't want that full time. 
So he's just not an interesting player, but that skill set that he provides, switchability, defensive value, takes a lot of threes. He's not replicated many spots on this roster. The comparisons for this bloke were amazing. The top statistical comparison was year seven of Harvey Grant, Horace's brother, Jeremy's dad. His second best comp was year eight of Harvey Grant. His third best comp was year nine of Harvey Grant. So I reckon he's Harvey Grant. That's pretty much what he is at this point. His impact was okay. 69th in EPM, 64th percentile crafted. His rim frequency, so contesting frequency at the rim, 73rd percentile. And for a 6'7", 6'7", 6'7", power forward, small forward, who played center, that's really impressive. He does those dirty things that the team doesn't have other guys to do. But he's so limited in so many areas. We just don't care from fantasy. But the reason we care is that like he's the seventh guy I've mentioned here who's possibly a starter, is that if he plays and plays good minutes, other people can't. Johnson can't. Simmons can't. Schroeder might not. Backup centers might not. Eventually, there is a very clear replacement for Finney Smith coming on this team. But, you know, he's just one of those guys that the value is there. It just blocks a lot of stuff for us, fantasy-wise. What about the rest of the squad? Got three more guys I want to go through who I think are worth discussing. And one of those is Dennis Smith Jr., who, when he starts, is a fantasy viable player. But, like Cam Johnson, he can't stay healthy. I don't know that he's going to be on this team. And his offense stinks. Well, sorry. No, again, I said that wrong. His shooting stinks. He ended up 193rd in minus one rankings. He averaged six and a half points with three and a half assists and 1.2 steals in 19 minutes only. That is why he's good. Assists and steals in low minutes. But 29% on threes, 44 overall, 74 from the line. That's really bad. The best comps for him, Michael. Shout out to Michael for spelling Michael wrong. Michael Ray, I didn't spell it wrong. He did. Michael Ray Richardson, year five, Nets legend. And Alfred Payton in year six. And we all know what Payton was, a putrid shooter who was a pretty good defender and now is out of the league. Smith was one of the best players impact-wise on this entire team. 82nd percentile EPM, 72nd in crafted because defensively he's that good. But he can't shoot. Shooting quality, 19th percentile. And eventually, if you have to play big minutes, that's going to get found out. And again, what do you do when Simmons is the other guy out there who also can't shoot? And now Smith is a free agent. He's 26, played 56 games. When the starting role is there for him, we use it. But it's just so hard to work around that. Dayron Sharp was the Nets' backup center most of the season. Jacques Vaughn annoyed us because Claxton got hurt early. We went, all right, great opportunity to grab Dayron Sharp. Let's get some numbers in. And then he got DMP'd or played three minutes. It made no sense. He started two games only, Dayron Sharp this season. And in the end, he lost his rotation spot to Noah Clowney. But there is so much to like about him from a lot of his metrics that is a little confusing that we just don't get to see extended run. He finished 255th in minus one. He averaged seven points with six rebounds in just 15 minutes, 0.7 blocks in 15 minutes. So you're talking about a 13 and 13, 1.6 block player on close to 60% shooting. He's going to be that classic center with the points, well, not, not even points, rebounds, field goals, blocks. I think there is maybe something for him shooting-wise. He shot 27% on threes. He started to take more of them. Maybe that comes, but he's a beast offensive rebounder. He's a very strong rebounder. But again, I don't think the Nets really like him. I don't think that they're, he's high in their prioritization. The best comps for him, year eight of Andrew Bogut and year three of Al Jefferson. Two really, really good players. And Sharp is just buried. I think there's something hiding here for him. I'm not sure it's going to happen in Brooklyn, but if Claxton does move on, maybe Sharp's the starter. If Sharp is the starting center here, well, he is a clear, clear top 100 draftable player. We just don't know that that's going to happen. His impact metrics, EPM, 76th percentile, 70th on crafted. His rim defense, so maybe this is why they just don't like him. How impactful were you as a rim deterrent or rim defender? 39th percentile is bad. Like he could test the shots, but he didn't impact opponents' field goal percentage there at all. That's really bad. Even though he got blocks, the rim defense was bad. He's only 22. It's really his first year of being a key part of a rotation or a major part. And I just think that they didn't quite utilize him right. Maybe there's something they know that we don't. I'm sure there is. 
but I wouldn't be writing him off completely. But part of the reason why I'm a little skeptical about what Sharp can do is this bloke, Noah Clowney. I was very high on Clowney, really young player coming out of Alabama. I thought he should have been a lottery pick. Super young. He's still not even 20. Shades of Paul Millsap. I use that name a lot. Maybe some three-point shooting that develops. Small ball-ish center, plays the four, can rebound, can score. Maybe not the passing that Millsap had, but the rim protection, great. And down the end, they finally gave him a shot, and it was good. His numbers, you'll look at him and go, well, what's this? 314th in minus one, that's trash. 309th in points, that's not good. Six points, three rebounds. What are you talking about, Josh? 0.7 blocks, half a three. That's in 16 minutes. So let's just double it to 32. We're talking 12 and seven, 1.5 blocks, one three, 1.6 assists. As a rookie who's 19, that's really good. 63 on his twos, 36 on his threes. His two comps are really interesting. Number one is rookie year Costa Kufos, and you go, well, that's not exciting. The second best comp was rookie year Chris Bosch, and you go, that's bloody exciting. And this is before Bosch really started shooting threes. His impact wasn't fantastic. 28th in EPM percentile, 45th in crafted. That's okay as a 19-year-old rookie. What I was, what I'm massively encouraged by is his relative foul rate, 70th percentile. He's a rookie big man. He did not foul very much. That's a huge encouraging sign. 19.8. I don't know why I said it that way, but he's not 20. He's 19.8 years of age. He plays 16 minutes. His G League stats, 30 minutes a night. 15 points, 8 rebounds, 1.8 blocks, 0.8 steals, 32% on threes on 2.5 attempts a game. He can play the 4 and the 5. And at the 4, at the moment, it's Finney Smith, it's Johnson, I guess. Maybe it's Simmons. At center, it's Claxton and Sharp. I would say that Clowney is going to be penciled in. If they had a big depth chart in their organizational offices, they'd be looking at it and go, well, in 2026, he's our starter. Somewhere he will start. And it might happen as early as next season, but they will be penciling him in year three, starter. And that's how I think you should view him for fantasy. We saw it down the stretch. Blocks, points, rebounds, threes, not bad percentages, solid from the line, a real up-and-coming, I won't say star, but something I'm interested in. Their other first-round pick, and they'll pick back-to-back, another guy that I thought could have been a lottery pick, was the pimple Derek Whitehead, but he played two games. I'm not going to really tell you much about that. Then he had season-ending surgery. And the reason that Whitehead slipped was worry about injuries with his leg in particular. And that's that's what happened. So I, I'm i going to reserve judgment on Whitehead because, we, again, he just didn't play. He played 17 G League games and averaged nine points on 27% shooting from three, which is obviously not very good. But we just didn't get to see enough. So hopefully he's able to get back in business and um, give us something next season. But Clowney, as a rookie, if you want to talk about young things you're excited about on this team, it's got to be him. I'm very excited. To, he's not going to be a number one option offensively or number two option offensively. He's not going to be Victor Weminyama or Rudy Gobert defensively. But he's going to be able to do quite a few things, I think. And... I'm not sure how much the general populace or even the fantasy populace or even the hardcore fantasy populace has keyed in on that, especially because a lot of his damage was done after most leagues finished. And I'd be really interested. I think there's an outside shot at top 150 next season. And I would say the year after we are looking at some real good things happening. I'm very, very encouraged. I'm not sure if you can tell by the tone of my voice. I'm very encouraged by Noah Clowney. And I don't say that about any anybody on this team. I'd be encouraged if you hit the thumbs up as well or left left your comments on YouTube and double banged and listened to the video and the audio. That would be great. But in the meantime, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.